Okay, so we're gonna get uh, started with five, five to 10 minutes for questions. If there's any question for uh, the talk of, um, uh, from uh, Caroline Davis, if anybody has a question, so go to the microphone and introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. I'm France Bellil from Paris. Uh, I have uh, comments more than questions for uh, Dr. Davis. Um, of course, your, your talk was extremely informative and, and, and interesting. I, I, I think that when we address this problem of uh, looking at uh, disordered food intake as, as addiction, uh, th there are quite a number of things that we should take into consideration. One of which is the fact that food uh, is something totally different from tobacco or cocaine. We, we all are dependent on food. Our newborn infants are dependent on food. We have this um, relationship to food that we cannot do without. So this creates, I think, a situation that uh, is completely different from uh, getting addicted later on in life with tobacco or with, or with cocaine. cocaine. There's also a lot of very interesting literature around about the, the critical, the very important uh, uh, biopsychological importance of sweetness as a stimulus, uh, not only for adults, but for, for children, for infants. Uh, and this is also uh, something very important that we should take into consideration when, when looking at our relationship with certain types of foods. And the last comment I would like to make, I don't want to monopolize the, the, the speaking time. Uh, I, I've, lived, I've been fortunate enough to live in a country for the last 40 years where people are absolutely, absolutely obsessed with foods and the palatability of foods. And uh, strangely enough, uh, the French, uh, to call them by their name, uh, they're, they're not terribly obese, they're not ter terribly fat, actually they have one of the lowest uh, obesity prevalence uh, in the developed world. So uh, saying that palatability is the critical thing that makes people obese and makes them addict and make, makes them lose control, perhaps is a bit uh, short. Uh, we, we should look at this uh, uh, influence uh, in, in uh, a more, a broader way, probably. Uh, well, thank you for your comment. I hope <coughs> I can just say something, um, which what you say is, n is not unheard. You know, a lot of people say that. We need food to eat. We don't need, <coughs> we don't need tobacco to survive. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to say a few things. First of all, all addictive substances have great differences, one from the other, and that's often ignored um, when people bring food into the mix or indeed internet use or gambling or any of these things. They're not even substances. Um, and I, I tried to say, but maybe I didn't say it clearly enough, that food is not a good term because you're absolutely right. We need food to to survive, but we don't need bags of potato chips to survive. Um, and we don't need uh, uh, the foods that, that people do binge on and that people um, are their troubling foods. So I've spent a lot of time working, <clears throat> not in a therapeutic capacity, but as a scientist, as a researcher, with populations that struggle um, with compulsive overeating and they don't overeat on salad, and they don't overeat on carrot sticks and things like that. It is these foods that we didn't used to have in our diet. Um, that's, I wish there was a good and easy name for it. Um, I would not equate in any way at all, all people that are overweight and overeat as having problems with addiction. But I think that there's a very, a subset of people who consume chronically and, um, in excess, and, and they have other vulnerabilities. Um, these, these foods, these processed um, hyperpalatable foods, they're, they're, it's always the same problem. It, as I said, it's not um, breakfast cereal that people tend to overeat. So I wanted to make that clear. <laughs> and maybe I didn't enough in my talk, but thank you for your comments. Uh, Jim Hill, University of Colorado. Uh, you began your talk by dismissing physical activity, saying there's no evidence physical activity has declined. This is just not true. There's evidence that physical activity has declined is at least as strong as the evidence that food intake has increased. 
Tim Church showed occupational and transportational physical activities gone down by hundreds of calories. Steve Blair showed uh, household activities gone down, and Dave Bessett compared the Amish with virtually no obesity to non-Amish and found uh, the difference in energy expenditure was more than enough to explain obesity. I think we really do a disservice when we try to uh, focus on food alone or physical activity. This is very complex, and physical activity actually affects appetite regulation. In fact, as you go from an active person to a sedentary person, every aspect of your physiology, including neural regulation of food intake changes. And I know this makes the situation more complex, but I think we do a disservice by not focusing on that. And finally, the evidence now of uh, looking at using doubly labeled water to measure energy expenditure of different populations has suggested it's not different. Our energy expenditure is the same as hunter-gatherers, all these other cultures. If that's true, it suggests that we're actually not eating any more calories. So my point is that I think we make a mistake when we try to focus on one or the other thing. And this argument about attributing to obesity to food intake alone or physical activity has been, in my opinion, something that has really hurt the field. I don't know of any population that's ever existed on the planet with low levels of physical activity and low levels of obesity. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know which data you're looking at, but um, I feel confident in saying that in the period of time I was talking about, and maybe it's leisure time physical activity, but um, the physical activity levels from you know the 80s onwards have not really changed. You're just not reading the literature then. Thank you. Okay, for that nice comment, thank you. Um, I have a comment here because it's not generally known that before I became interested in geography and economics, I was actually a professor of psychiatry, first at um, Cornell University Medical College and then at the University of Michigan uh, um, School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry, and I was actually on um, the panel that developed um, the definition of the binge eating disorder for DSM-4. So a couple of questions um, or issues. One is that um, we have been very careful to say that the food liking and craving and so on are very distinct from addictions. And in fact, the psychiatry field is going away from addictions by having rejected essentially the definition of addiction for inclusion in DSM-5 and what you see there instead is substance use disorder, which is very broadly phrased and has actually 11 criteria, not seven, and they deal with um, the getting of the substance and so on. But the substance, such as it is that people are craving, wanting to have, and so on, or in, indulging in, wrong word, um, using in the case of a binge eating disorder is culture specific. So in North America, it does seem to be sugar-fat combination between donuts, ice cream, and so on. But for example, in France, based on work by our friend Pierre Hermès, the major binge-eating substrate appears to be cheese, uh, which is not sweet, and it's really a combination of protein and fat and salt, and um, that is culturally specific. So for binge-eating disorder, we should not be blaming a given food. It really is the person again, and the food varies depending on the cultural context. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for a very interesting talk. I was wondering about, <clears throat> I think all of us have seen uh, people with the kinds of problems you've outlined. In fact, I understand one of the ex-commissioners of the Food and Drug Administration has written a book about this because of his problems. But uh, I wondered what percent of the general obese people in south of the border in the United States you think have those sorts of addictions, and that this is the cause of their uh, overweight and obesity? Um, <clears throat> I really wouldn't wish to, um, to hazard a guess. Um, small percentage, like, like um, any other you know, psychopathology. Um, single digits, I'm sure. I, I don't really know. I, I'm not an epidemiologist. I really don't know. Sorry, I can't help. <laughs>
you have a question? General question or? General question. General question. Okay. Uh, it's for Dr. Brunstrom. Uh, Dr. Brunstrom, in infants who are on breastfeeding, where would cognition play in terms of intake? Is, is their intake control more by fullness versus? Well, <clears throat> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't profess, sorry, I wouldn't profess to be represent myself as an expert on uh, infant uh, feeding, breastfeeding, and the uh, emergence of cognition in, uh, in that group. There is a literature around demand-led feeding and, um, and the extent to which different feeding practices promote uh, certain styles of eating perhaps later on in life. Um, uh, the, the argument there would be that uh, perhaps bottle-fed children, uh, babies, um, uh, take early, um, the, the parents take control, or the mother, mum typically will take control over the amount of milk that's consumed, whereas perhaps a, a breastfed infant might uh, acquire some uh, a capacity to be able to so-called regulate or control food intake because it, from a very early age, has control. But. Um, um, it, it, it's very difficult, I think, in those very early years, post reading to, uh, for me to make really comment on, 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 on when cognition really starts to play a role. I imagine that the transition starts at that point, but perhaps progresses all the way through early childhood into mid-childhood and adolescence. Um, I have a question here for Jeff, if I may. Um, I've admired Jeff's work for a very long time and have been reading his papers on the method of constant stimuli. And I was especially struck by the various foods which give you the same perception of satiation, but they are in fact different in calories. So in fact, uh, we submitted a proposal one time, not funded, I'd love to work on it with you, uh, which foods would produce the maximum amount of happiness for the fewest calories. Same exact method, different dependent variable, what foods give you the most amount of happiness and satisfaction in terms of pleasure for the fewest calories, what would they be? Sorry, what, what, what would the foods be? Yes. Ah, well, <laughs> no. now you see, if I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here, I'd be on my tropical island somewhere in <laughs> my cocktail. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, yes, I don't, I don't, I don't know the, the answer to that um, question. I'm sure there are lots of food companies that would like to know the answer. But, technique can but uh, um, I think there's sort of, I think that, well, I think that's a discussion that we should certainly have. And if we can crack it, then maybe um, we'll try to reap some rewards somehow. But I, I, I think that um, it, that's exactly the kind of next question that I think we should be um, asking. I think that um, one of the uh, questions that we should be thinking is what is actually being metered when we eat? And is it the case that we're metering uh, fullness? Because it might well be that we're also met metering um, reward and pleasure. Um, and it would be very nice to come up with the same sort of scale to determine whether or not some foods calorie for calorie deliver more pleasure and then to build that into this sort of yes. model. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. Yeah. So in fact, um, in the last presentation, um, Jen talked very briefly about research to make foods less palatable. I think it's kind of a first world problem. I would not go that way. I think making foods more satisfying for fewer calories is the way to go. Add to that because what what you both started presenting here was how does the person think about the food? Uh, happiness is a much more uh, relevant construct for someone who's making a choice about what to eat, as opposed to palatability. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, taste has always been part of the equation. But I think you know flipping the questions around like that, I think, are really important directions to take with the kind of research that you're doing. And yes, science can answer some of those questions if they ask the right question. No, I, I, thinking about that some more and just adding to that. Um, certainly, it, you know, if, if we look at um, you know, animal models of, of learning and reward, um, there, there, there isn't a lot of evidence, certainly in rodents, that 
fullness in satiety is reinforcing. That is, for example, if you put a gastric balloon in a rodent and you inflate it, the animal will avoid the environment within which it experiences that gastric balloon. Now, there are rather more subtle ways to explore this, but essentially, feeling full in of itself is not a particularly rewarding experience unless you've consumed and enjoyed the pleasure associated with that food. So CCK, if you inject somebody with CCK, it's a sort of satiety hormone, that doesn't generate pleasure. It probably just generates nausea. So I think that when we're thinking about developing foods that can help and aid and benefit weight loss, um, focusing solely on satiety and satiation could generate the same sort of effect over time, a, a, a general avoidance, if at least the pleasure associated with that food isn't sustained. So I agree that's equally as important. But this could be where energy dense foods come in, because for example, if you're eating something like chocolate, you pack a lot of energy in a very small volume, so you can get the maximum satisfaction, at the same time, no stomach distension, which would prevent you from eating more. So um, there is a dissociation here between the kind of feeling of nausea and bloating and the huge caloric wallop that you get from energy dense foods. <coughs> So coming back to this idea, I think like I, I always remember like reading about the blue zones of the planet, which are the areas in the world where there is, you know, a very um, very high prevalence of very healthy uh, longevity and very spectacular compared to other parts of the world. There is an area in Japan in the Okinawa Islands where that has the lo the longest. Um, uh, living woman in the world, the highest prevalence. And when you read the, the book about what they do, you know, they, they seem to have some sort of a set of rules to stop eating until they have basically a, a bit more conscious sense of fullness. So also I, wanna, I wanted to, to raise that, that question of how much of the feeling of cessation also is influenced by our social norms or our obsession of our, our idea of getting out of hunger and of, because of, of our convenient lives, and how all that can be also playing a role in appetite control. And here we have a, um, a person, you know, who, Jeff, you are doing studies with the Samburo. So, um, you know, how the, the cultural normative on, on how to respond to the natural single, uh, signals varies across cultures and, you know. Yeah, like how, for instance, in the case of Samburu, how do they have any different kind of view on yeah, all so, that? Yeah, so, yeah, I suppose so. So, um, as I say, satiety and, uh, and, and, and satiation, extreme over-satiety or over-satiation is a, an unpleasant experience, and it's partly unpleasant because it generates a soporific effect. It essentially, essentially puts us uh, to sleep and, we f and it impairs our cognitive uh, performance. So that's one of the reasons why I think we don't eat, some of, many of us don't eat particularly large lunches, for instance, if we have work to do in the afternoon and so on. So I think that when we want to understand food intake and meal size, we also need to understand how that person interacts with their environment, what their other primary reinforcers and objectives are between meals. Now, in, in the Samburu, if you offer um, um, a, a Samburu gentleman some food to eat ad libitum, because I've been there and seen this, this gentleman will probably eat and eat and eat. And whereas we will have lunch for 10 minutes, a Samburu gentleman might eat for 45 minutes to an hour, and then find a tree and then fall asleep. Because food is prized in that kind of environment where there isn't much food available. And that is, seems to me to be the optimal response, to eat as much as possible and to tolerate the over-satiating effects when food is available. So culture of food availability and knowing what we're doing next and what our priorities are all feed into decisions and the food choices that we make. And to get that understanding, that broad understanding of, 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 of dietary behavior, I think we need to cast our, wet night, our, our, our net widely and, and, and understand the context within which we're making dietary decisions.
So another question that is also general to the, to the um, role of, you know, or the, the importance of reward in, in food intake regulation, it also, you know, comes always this idea that, um, you know, whether people are eating to fill in the void that, that they don't have in other aspects of their life. So what is the state of the evidence that, um, you know, that we would need less reward from food if we were able to find it in other places, you know, to kind of um, broaden up the discussion of a societal reward and all that stuff. What do you think based on the current evidence for that statement? Can I answer that? Um, there's some very interesting work in France that Claude Fischler and Franz Bill will be talking about, I think, tomorrow. And the issue is that we're increasingly eating alone. So two components. Um, one is that we do derive pleasure by eating with others, and the meals are better, they taste better, we enjoy them more. So what's going to happen when we eat alone is increasingly we do. So the French approach, of course, to that is that as we eat alone, we need to eat better foods, tastier foods, more cheese, better wine, in order to provide us with the pleasure that other people provide us normally. So in fact, eating alone versus eating together may change the quality of the meal, but I'll leave it to our experts tomorrow to deal with the French approach to this issue. Um, I've heard wonderful uh, discussion so far, but I never heard the word alcohol mentioned. And yet I noticed last night at the reception there was quite a bit of it flowing. What effects does it have on appetite? I, I, I did say better wines. <laughs> Any more questions here? There's a general question also that we didn't touch on. It's a little bit divergent from, from what the discussion was going, but... Um, do you have another question? Okay. Hi, Perfect. I just have a question for clarity. Um, I enjoyed everyone's presentation, especially the um, Dr. Davis with hedonic um, hunger. I just wanted to ask for clarification. Um, I think Dr. Adam, you said that food quality is not a factor with obesity, with social economic status in your presentation, and I wanted to ask what does that mean? And also, I know two people talked about um, food deserts don't actually increase people's ability, which was another question, if you thought food deserts actually cause a problem with um, availability of food, so they don't actually have the healthy food, the quality food to eat, if that affects the obesity rates with social economic status, if that makes any sense. Okay, let me rephrase that. There is definitely a connection between diet quality and obesity. I think the connection is probably mediated through cost because in many cases the empty calories cost more than do some, not all, nutrient-rich foods. And so this notion of the food deserts, which we have been so used to, has been framed in terms of the actual physical distance to the store. Now that can be certainly a factor in some places like New Orleans, Detroit, um, New York City, but in Seattle where I live, pretty much everyone shops by car. So whether or not a supermarket is a mile away or two miles away really makes no difference. What does make a difference is whether you can afford to stop, you know, step through the door. So in fact, food access is more properly measured in terms of economic access and economic distance as opposed to physical proximity. And this is what our research is all about. So in addition to having geographic location for where everyone lives, we also track them using GPS tracking devices as they go about their business and shop for food. So for example, we find people do not shop in their immediate neighborhood. They go to the store that is right for them. And that store may be some miles away, and in fact, lower income people drive further to get bargains and cheaper food. So there are a number of things that people do, and it's again a complex issue about how people interact now with their food environment in both time and space. Not easy to follow, and as I say, the kind of simplistic idea that people who just go out of their door and shop in the next door neighborhood does not hold true under all circumstances. And I'll just add to that since I also mentioned the food deserts, but that, you know, those points are all uh, very important to understand because many of the people who have discovered food deserts have used some of this geospatial location data, but just looked at where physically are 
uh, on grocery stores without looking at the issues of transportation and accessibility that characterize a consumer response to these things and not the, quote, expert opinion about how these things should work. But the data that I did right there at the end, or quoted from at the end, was a study that was done in Philadelphia and in inner cities. And the point is that simply identifying geographically where is a space that a lot of people don't have access to a grocery store. And if we put a grocery store into that location, what happens? The finding is, is not very much uh, because they haven't accounted for the consumer preferences and the consumer behaviors that go into it, nor have they really thought through the marketing of now that we've introduced this store, how do we get people familiar with it, used to it? How do we use that? How does that store satisfy their relevant needs and wants and not just the expert-driven response of, okay, now there's a grocery store and people are within a mile and a half of a grocery store. Okay, so I think we're gonna close it here. So just thank, you know, just thank very much the panel and all the attendants for, for this wonderful session.